This playlist collects together and organizes the individual component modules, which together comprise our second lecture on arguments. We'll begin this lecture by reviewing some of the main ideas that we introduced in that first lecture. Then we'll review that first skill that we were developing in the lecture, namely the skill of being able to come across a written or spoken passage to evaluate whether or not the person intends to offer an argument. If they do, extracting that argument out and then rendering it in a manner that is both comprehensive and impactful, as well as sympathetic to the intent of the original argument creator. Towards that end, we'll start to talk about understanding an argument's inferential claim, differentiating between deductive and inductive claims so that we're better able both to extract and to formulate arguments, as well as ultimately to evaluate arguments based on the logical form as it's captured in the inferential claim. We'll end this lecture by introducing a second skill, the skill of using the counterfactual method to evaluate the validity, that is the goodness or badness of deductive arguments. In that first lecture on arguments, we introduced arguments by saying that they are artifacts. And we said that doesn't mean that arguments are old and no one cares about them, that they're dusty and irrelevant or arcane. No, instead, as the British philosopher and logician Bertrand Russell might say, arguments are human creations, products of human artifice. They are tools. And like all tools, arguments are created for specific purposes. In fact, humans have even created sciences to study how best to make and use arguments. Now, at a first pass, we can describe how arguments function by saying that arguments are structured collections of statements. We went on to say in the lecture that we could understand how arguments function even more precisely by saying that they are structured collections of statements that function as models of inferences. And we can introduce a number of different metaphors to help us understand that claim. We can say that arguments are like trails so that we can follow down the pathway of an argument and go towards the goal in the same manner in which the argument's creator did. We can think of arguments as maps that indicate to us how we can get from the beginning set of information that we have to some other location in our information landscape. And finally, we can think about arguments in the third way, the way that we emphasized in that first lecture. We can think of arguments like a bridge, a set of stepping stones that allow us to get from one side of a river to another side of the river. So arguments function to allow us to get from our initial information to our conclusion, and they do so in a way that facilitates our actually being able to get across without difficulty. So a good argument, like a good stepping stone bridge, will place each content element in relationship to the other content elements so as to facilitate an easy traverse of that chasm from the beginning information to the suggested conclusion. Analogies like this can help us to understand how it is that arguments can serve as models of inferences for the purposes of communication, persuasion, evaluation, and so on. But if we want to get an understanding of it that transcends mere superficial analogies, we need to remind ourselves how we understood inferences to work and then relate how they work to how arguments work. So let's take a step back and remind ourselves about inferences. Remember, we said that inferences are these psychological processes that transform explicit and available information to generate new information that is now explicit and potentially available to a system. We said that when we think about the nature of inferences, we can distinguish between two different kinds of inferences. 
On the one hand, we have these deductive inferences. And a deductive inference will start off with what the reasoner has explicit and available to them in the form of information for the purposes of making an inference. Now, given what they know, there's a whole world of things that are also guaranteed to be true given that knowledge. However, none of that information is explicit or available to the reasoner prior to a deductive inference. In a deductive inference, the reasoner takes the initial information, transforms that information, utilizing it to render some of the other things that have to be true, explicit and potentially available to them as well. So that deductive arguments are non-amplitive arguments. They don't increase the scope of our knowledge in the sense that nothing that isn't already guaranteed to be true won't, will be made true as a result or will be made explicit as a result of a deductive inference. Nevertheless, they do help us because they make things that have to be true, given what we know, explicit so that we can see that they're true and use the information about that being the case in order to adaptively interact with the world or make other inferences, engage in other processes, and so on. Now, inductive inferences also start from that pool of explicit and available truths that the reasoner has there. And what their goal is, is to trade a little bit of that guarantee of truth in order to leverage principles about the way the world works or relationships between situations such that they can transform that initial information in a way that, while it sacrifices a bit of the guarantee of truth, will render implicit and unavailable but highly probable statements explicit and potentially available to the reasoner. And in this way, inductive inferences are said to be amplitude inferences. That is, they increase the scope of what a reasoner has as potentially true about the world. They do so, though, at the cost of introducing a little epistemic risk, that chance that even though they started with good information, the reasoner ends up with something that's likely but actually false. And so all of our inferences are psychological processes. Those processes can be divided into two general categories, ones that preserve truth versus ones that trade off a little bit of that preservation of truth in order to amplify a reasoner's truth or extend the scope of the things that they have available to them as potential descriptions of the world. When we turn our attention to arguments, we discover that they have almost the exact same structural relationship that we observed when we talked about inferences. So we can define that class of statements that are highly likely to be true, given what the reasoner knows. Within that, we can define that subset of things that absolutely have to be true, given what they know. Within that, we have this subset of things that they really do have explicitly available for them. And in this case, that's things that they can encode as statements. Those initial statements then are encoded as premises, the correlate to initial information. The goal of an argument is to show the relationship that might be created through an inferential transformation. That is show a relationship between the statements that encode the premises and a statement that includes the conclusion together with a relationship, the deductive inferential claim that illustrates how these two things are related to each other for the purposes of inference. We find a similar relationship with inductive inferences. We have an encoding, a set of statements that expresses an initial set of information. We have a statement that expresses, expresses a conclusion and we have a inductive inferential claim. And that claim says, if these premises are true, then I claim this conclusion is very likely to be true, is highly probable. Same as with the deductive claim, where we say, if these premises are true, then the conclusion I claim has to be true, given their truth. 